This is my new wheel and tire configuration that unfortunately isn't getting along with my coilover setup that cost me almost $5,000, even at its max ride height. So I swapped it out for some stiffer lowering springs and a new set of camber plates, resulting in this major wheel gap. This is because the lowering spring needed to be all the way up in order to have any preload. And although this would fix the rubbing issue, this gap is a bit excessive, which brings us to helper springs. These would give us about two and a half inches to work with when the suspension is at full droop, while only taking up about one inch at ride height. Although this requires a little bit more work, going with this option will result in a better handling car and tire longevity versus using spacers or dialing in more camber. Start by removing the lateral cowl panels, which are each held in by three 10 millimeters and a push rivet, giving you access to all the 13 millimeters holding in the carbon brace. Then remove the lateral plastic covers and rubber coverings over the aluminum brace, all of which are held in by push rivets, but one on the driver's side is blocked by this cover that is held in by a single T20 screw. Now we can loosen the lateral T50s, the E12s at the strut tower, and the E18s at the top so we can remove the aluminum brace. Just be mindful of the positive battery terminal. With the engine bay prepped, let's go down and jack up the car and secure it on jack stands before removing the wheels. It's best to have both sides up for this so that no preload is introduced and we can ensure both sides are set to the same height without wasting time. If you already have coilovers in, lower the spring so that there's no more tension in the system. But even if there's some tension left because the collar can't go low enough, that's fine. For now, remove the end link from the strut as well as any spacers. No need to remove it from the sway bar end. As a precaution, let's unhook these wires so we have some extra slack. Time to bring in the jack and lift up the wheel assembly slightly so it has some support without putting any pressure on the spring. Up top, we'll need a 22mm pass-through socket and a 9mm counter hole to remove the top nut. With it out, let's lower the strut to right around the base of the strut tower. If you already have these camber plates, make sure to hang on to this bottom sleeve. Depending on your car's age, the camber plate will be held in by 3 or 5 13mm bolts. Now we can easily remove the bump stop, dust boot, and with some encouragement, even the spring. Honestly, this gasket is in good enough condition to be reused, but I had another one ready to go, so I decided to replace it. While we're here, let's also clean the threads, and since the new spring's inner diameter is 60mm and the spring perch is 61.5mm, let's apply a thin layer of anti-seize on the collar. The cool thing about Vorschlag is if you have one of their later model camber plates, you only need to order the 60mm spring perch as the top plate is compatible with both perch designs. Looking at them side by side, we can see that the mounting location is the same on both models, providing up to 32 millimeters of sliding adjustment. The OEM model is very well designed. As you can see, the perch is pressed into the thrust bearing, and therefore the monoball takes no direct force from the spring. Even the thrust bearing was still very smooth after two years worth of driving. But the main reason that I prefer Vorschlag camber plates over other manufacturers is that they use the largest monoball in any camber plate design. This allows it to take on bigger loads like stiffer springs and piston forces for a longer period of time and it also appears to be held in by a snap ring so those services should be simple enough when the time comes. The only downside I see here is that the smaller perch applies the spring force into the monoball where the OEM perch does not. However, the perch has lots of articulation, which will allow the spring to compress evenly even if you decide to crank up the camber. As far as height, the 60mm perch is about a half inch higher up than the OEM version, with the new spring two and a quarter inch shorter than the KWs and the helpers taking up anywhere from 0.8 to 2.4 inches. When we install this on the strut, we'll start with the helper spring, followed by the metal thrust sheet, the spring adapter, another thrust sheet, the main spring, bump stop, a third thrust sheet, the nylon shim, then the spring perch, all of which will get pressed into the top of the camber plate with the gasket on top. 
As far as adjustments go, there's two positions for the set screws. The outer settings on the flat side will allow you to get all sideways, while the inner setting towards the curved end will allow you to slide it all the way back to the stock setting. This is where I'm going to start until I can get an alignment. The set screws are a quarter inch hex, and hand tight is fine for now. When you drop in the helper spring, you'll have to press it into place as the inner diameter is a little smaller than the spring perch. Then as you place on the thrust sheets and spring adapter, you'll see that there's little wiggle room for the adapter if it were to lose the connection between the springs under suspension travel. And this is why we want the helper spring on the bottom versus the top. In terms of performance and ride quality, having it on top or bottom is up for debate, at least from what I found. And the more important thing is that we don't want these components getting misaligned as the assembly goes up and down. However, as long as we have some preload at full droop, we should be fine but better safe than sorry. Here I went with the OEM bolts, but depending on how much camber you want, you may need the Vorschlag bolts as they are shorter and will not interfere with the perch as it slides more inward. When you jack up the assembly, you should hear it lock into place before threading on the top nut. Although Vorschlag says to use an impact to tighten this, here we shouldn't need to. The top nut should thread down enough that by the time the strut starts to spin, the counter hold will poke out far enough for a nine millimeter and pass through socket. Just set your torque wrench to loosen at 40 newton meters. The 13s get 28 newton meters in the star pattern, as do the set screws. Going back down, reattach the wires and end link, which if you have the SPLs are set to 25 foot pounds. Now we can lower the jack and adjust the height. Considering these springs are almost double the spring rate of the KWs, but the overall length is similar, I started out at 7 and 3 quarters inch from the center of the pinch bolt to the top of the spring perch, so on the lower end of what KW recommends, which we still need to be mindful of. Because the big thing here is that we want the strut to still operate within its optimal stroke range. Working outside of this parameter could reduce performance and cause the strut to fail prematurely. So even if you want to go lower, I would suggest starting at the lower end of the recommended range and drive it for about a week before going down a few spins and retesting it for another week. And just continue that pattern until you find that sweet spot of aesthetics and performance. As far as spring rates and length, this was a recommendation directly from Swift. The surprising thing that I found out is that Swift is not actually a spring company. They're a metallurgy company that makes springs. This means that they have complete control over the metal production process that goes into their springs versus getting a spring from a third party vendor. They use their own proprietary steel end winding methods to deliver springs that according to them are the lightest, most consistent springs with the most amount of stroke travel and durability against height loss. All of which is a fancy way of saying we will get a more predictable and linear response from our suspension through the entire coilover travel. A lot of that having to do with the spring's nature, as the KWs are a progressive spring that is softer in the beginning and stiffen up as the suspension compresses during cornering or higher speeds. The swift springs are linear and will perform the same throughout their entire compression, so long as there's enough preload dialed in and they don't bind. Since we're still operating within the KW height recommendation, with a stiffer spring at almost the same height, bottoming out the shock shouldn't be an issue while preload will be car and spring specific. With this 8kg spring on the M235i, we should have about 2 inches of compression from just the weight of the car if we were to set it with zero preload. Although I doubt the suspension will ever be at full droop while driving, I would still like to have a few spins of security and having the helper spring there definitely achieves this. Plus having the main spring slightly compressed with its stiffer nature will give us more traction on the road. Just know that there is a trade-off in comfort when going to stiffer linear springs. So I'll also leave some additional resources and links to everything we used in the description. This should be a very safe height for your wheels, tires, and fenders, but expect to adjust it again after this. So let's bring it down and retorque the top nuts now that we have the weight of the car on it. Bring in the aluminum brace and only the two top E18s get 56 Newton meters while the E12s and T50s get 28, which happens to be the same for all the 13 millimeters on the carbon brace. Just make sure to start from the front and work your way to the back. Now you can put back on all of the coverings and those pesky push rivets, and don't forget that covering that's held in by the T20 screw. 
Now we can bring in our cow pieces and lock them into place. Then go for a test drive and see how it feels. For adjustments, I prefer to use two jacks as it makes things a little faster and won't be holding the car up for all that long. In total, I went down five spins using the set screw as my indicator, bringing the distance from the perch to the pinch bolt down to about 7.4 inches. If you want, you could also go down a half or quarter turn more on the passenger side to account for when you're in the driver's seat. Until I can address the rears, this is fine as I have no issues with bumpy roads, speed bumps, or driveways. For my situation, I barely notice a difference in comfort. The bad roads in my area are so bad, it doesn't matter what suspension you have. But I can definitely tell I have more grip in the front and no more rubbing or clearance issues. From the lip of the wheel to the fender, it's right at 22.6 inches, and here are some of my other measurements as well. But if you want to get lower than this, then you'll definitely need to roll your fenders. That you can easily do by checking out this video. And I'll see you in that one.